welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our uh, Game of Thrones review and discussion. We have, uh, since we weren't uh, able to record the week uh, before, we were going to cover two the two, the last two episodes, which is uh, uh, Blood of My Blood and uh, what is the the Broken Man? Yeah, the Broken Man. The Broken Man. So I'm just going through Wikipedia because you can only you can only remember so much. Real to kind of, I'm just gonna highlight uh, kind of more of the the. I'm just gonna highlight the more uh, I guess stuff that stood out to me the most. I'm, I'm not gonna really go through a whole lot like like I usually do. Is just kind of read everything on Wikipedia because that's kind of mm-hmm. that's a little bit tedious. But I'm just gonna go through the highlights here real quick. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, so we have Bran experiencing. We're gonna go through Blood of My Blood, which is mm-hmm. uh, the, the previous what, episode. the previous episode before the one we recently. We uh, have yeah. If you want to go through that real quick, sure. Um, we have Mir and Bran uh, trying to outrun the Whites, uh, and he Br- while Bran's still getting a vision of uh, what's happening in the past and the future and uh, in the present and they're about to be killed by the whites when uh, they they're saved by somebody and they eventually and they're uh, saved by this random stranger who takes them in and, and helps them it's revealed to be Benjamin Stark uh, Bran's uncle who finally comes into the show and he uh, said that he was stabbed in the gut by a white walker's sword and left to die but the children of the forest came to rescue him and uh, stop the magic that would have turned him from being a white. So he's still dead, alive. So he was, he died, but he kept, uh, but he came back. And so he says, now he must uh, that Bran must be the three eyed raven, and uh, the realms of uh, and that basically Bran needs to get everything ready to uh, prepare the world of men for the White Walkers. And then uh, we have In the Reach, which uh, Sam and Gilly uh, uh, finally arriving at, arriving at House Tarly. And the, uh, Sam not really mentioning that his dad hates uh, wildlings, so they have to do their best to keep it under wraps. Uh, but of course they have, uh, the, while the sister and the mother absolutely love them, Sam's father is of course jackass because this is Game of Thrones and the only good father characters have to die. Yeah. <laughs> Where, you know, that there's like uh, the only like I think the only good one has been Eddard Stark or um, Davos, and Eddard died, and Davos' son was killed. So that that's basically it. There's no good dads left in uh, in Game of Thrones. Yeah, this 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 scene was uh, well. First off, it was pretty interesting to see quickly that we had a re- a reappearance of Benjamin Stark, which is like. Uh, a lot of like things like this, a lot of unveilings for like returning characters just goes by people's heads a lot. So it's like, with me kind of being a little bit more familiar with the books, I have a pretty, pretty decent memory of these names. I'm very surprised that I remember a lot of these names because you have to remember them, especially in the books, because they bring them up and mention them so many times that it kind of gets ingrained in your head. Not necessarily much with the show because that kind of the you, you get characters that show up here and there and then you never see from again. You get whiplash a lot of times. Yeah, you do get a lot of whiplash with this. Uh, I know, I know. Cat had a lot of trouble keeping up with a lot of the houses, and I even trying to explain it, like a lot of the reasonings behind certain houses, and then also like the motives. It just it goes. It's just so much information overload that it just it just kind of becomes. It's like second nature to me because I've was so familiar with reading a lot about this stuff in the books. Mm-hmm. So I mean, Cold Hands necessarily wasn't unveiled in the books as to be Benjamin Stark, but a lot of the fan theories out there thought it was him because he went, we went missing after like season one, after going off to the, like the north because he was at the north. You saw him a little bit in the, one of the episodes in the first season with uh, him talking to Jon Snow, and then at some point he just ended up ended up uh, disappearing. And now we now that we find out uh, the outcome of him, we'll see how things fair with him and, and how he's going to help Bran to fulfill some kind of destiny and op- and see how he plays into the later half of the of the series. There's some it, interesting theories going around that Bran will, will travel back in time to get to build the wall and become Bran the Builder uh, to the get the whole entire wall ready for the White Walkers 
And, uh, I mean, fan theories were correct about Jon Snow going back. So, uh, who knows? It's it's entirely possible, as we kind of noticed from the last previous episode before this, is uh, there was some impact that he had in terms of what affected Hordor. So there's certainly some things that he can possibly do. He probably has to hone more of his... His skills, but it, it does seem possible from in speculation and what we kind of saw that he does have it can have some effect in changing the, the future mm-hmm. or changing the past to affect the current time. So it's it's entirely possible. And to mention the oh my god, the most uncomfortable scene ever I've seen in, in the shows <laughs> with with uh, with Sam just getting completely railed just verbally by his, his dad and it was mentioned as well in the books that he, he has no he has no good no good standing with his dad he's just so incredibly cr- crusty and it's just uh, so so ignorant yeah it's it's, so, it's so uncomfortable it, it his his dad is a jackass cuz uh you know he uh he barely accepts the baby as is and then when they accidentally let it slip that um, uh, that uh, Sam was you know fighting along the wall and uh, and Gilly says like yes he fought here 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 and it's like wait a minute where did you say you were and then that was the straw that broke the camel's back of I mean it's just like we've seen so many scenes of bloodshed leading uh, being led up to those horrific moments and yet this was the most uncomfortable scene in the entire show. Yeah, not sure uh, how much of an impact uh, Sam will have, but it seems like there's going to be something if they're focusing on him and Gilly for a little bit of this episode. Um, so his intention really was to to have her be safe to, uh, in the safest place he could think of. It would be at his at, at his family's house, and as you saw kind of how he his dad acted to towards Wild Links, he he kind of second kind of second guessed himself and kind of changed his mind and ended up uh, her and Gilly ended up uh, splitting it in terms of like hanging out there at the house any longer. So it felt like it was he was she was better off with him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's pretty much it. And he took he took the the family's Valyrian steel. It's just rightfully his. He, he took he just go ahead and snatched that Harpsbane, man. <laughs> He's like, ah, the hell with it. If I if I'm going to be leaving on a on a high note, I might as well take what the hell's mine. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, likewise, we have uh, in King's Landing where Tommen is speaking uh, to the High Sparrow about uh, Marjorie's Walk of Atonement, and uh, the High Sparrow lets uh, Tommen see her. And it's it's weird because this is a moment where Tommen. Uh, sees Marjorie and she's just all about uh, the the faith now. Where the like the previous the very previous episode we saw her talking with her brother about like stay strong like they can't break us if we're strong together. And so there's some hints that this might be a ruse, but the acting is so good from Natalie Dormer that it's hard to really tell in this episode. Uh, yeah. Now that will become later in the next one, but uh, for now it's just it's a little bit hard to see if she's actually with it or not yeah that 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 was left as a question of contention which we'll get into in the next next episodes but it leads into uh it leads into jamie uh, arriving with an army from the house tyrell to attempt to save the queen and, and loris and then just leads into this whole uh conversation of uh of the high sparrow uh you know coming out there and and unveiling that uh that uh, Marjorie was uh, fully, fully endorsing the faith and everything, and and having like a house of the faith of the king and the gods and something like that, and just this whole yep. plan of them trying to retake, retake it, just ended up blowing in their face. Since like since Tommen was a part of it too, so it would be like some armies, some armies from the highest Tyrell going up against like the the freaking King's Guard. <laughs> they. Uh, I love the fact that uh, the uh, the I'm sorry, hold on. I'm, I'm trying to think about uh, the uh, who's the father of Marjorie of House Tyrell. The father. Hmm. Yeah. The, who was? Uh, the, no, I'm sorry. The um, 
uh, the, who was the who was leading the army? Who was he tries to give a speech and just like it's not that good. Oh yeah, and it's like not that lifting. It's like okay, it's you know whatever. This guy's kind of half assing it. Yeah, Mace Tyrell. Yeah, Mace Tyrell, and just, and they march in and they have this the big scene of oh Jamie uh, Crinch's <laughs> the speech. Yeah, yeah and and. They try to look imposing, and then you have Jamie ride up. Uh, the cool shot of Jamie riding up uh, on the stairs on the horse, and it's kind of all for naught since uh, it ends up with Tom and Marjorie being representatives for the High Sparrow, saying like, "Okay, now we're going to have a religious uh, uh, partnership between the Crown and the Faith," and everybody's great, and uh, uh, everyone's just like, "What the hell just happened?" And Elena is just like, "Oh my god." He's beaten us all. Yeah, and it's uh, and uh, Tommen is you know strips uh, Jamie of being uh, a position in the King's Guard because he attacked the Faith, which is just like, and once again, I got to give the writers and especially um, Jonathan Price uh, props for uh, this scene because I still don't know if he's if he's planning all this or if it's just kind of this natural evolution. Of, of what he wants and not just this long con of a game. I don't know because obviously this is what he wants and is what he's trying to push towards but I don't know if he planned all this in advance or just like, oh, wait a minute, I could I could use this to my advantage. Yeah, I don't know. It's it, he doesn't seem that uh, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would be planning so much steps ahead. He's not like uh He's he's not like Baelish. At least Baelish has like 20, 20 steps ahead of everybody else. I see. I feel like he's got that upper hand against everybody right now. Like I feel like he's a, that kind of a guy that has like he's like ahead of everybody, at least mm-hmm. twenty steps ahead. Th- this one seems like it's a little bit of that, but it also seems like it's a, a natural evolution where he perceives to is perceiving that it's. it's there's gonna be a point, and I cannot freaking wait for this to happen. For this, this <laughs> just this thing to end. For this to have some kind of uh, some kind violent of violent resolution, violent resolution, which is I wanted. I really wanted it, especially with the last episode too, which we'll get into l- later. Jesus. Oh, there's there's no news, but bad news. Uh, Jamie complains to Cersei that he's 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 been ordered to help Walder Frey, which is like the, the scum of the earth, the, the crusty. This crusty guy to recapture River Run. Oh, of course, he was the uh, the crazy old man in uh, the World's End. Yeah, <laughs> I I was drinking through this crazy straw. Not so crazy now, am I? Um, and then he instead intends to find Bronn, which we'll get an appearance on the next the, the next episode after this. Yay! And whatever killers Bronn can find to march into the Great Sept and kill the High Sparrow. Uh, Cersei says that he should go to Riverrun and show everyone how easily a Lannister can take a castle as to attack the High Sparrow and his fanatics will probably result in Jaime's death and destroy everything that they're working for. She does not need Jaime to be in the city for her trial and will be a trial it will be a trial by combat and she has the the mountain on her side. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. And she oh, is, yes. and she assures Jamie that they will still defeat all their enemies and they kiss uh, yeah, Cersei. We'll get into the discussion a little bit later too, and it's cer- it was really cool that it was <coughs> pointed out too by Olena to have their discussion in the, in the next episode. Now, oh, yes. she's got her faults and certainly doesn't seem as smart as she thinks she is, and it's really, really well, awesome scene. Um, so we get the next scene into the Bravos, mm-hmm. where we have uh, we have Arya speaking to Lady Crane about. Um, Watching, uh, well, uh, speaking to Lady Crane after watching uh, the same play that she saw the other night, um, about how, and, and specifically how the actor who plays Tyrion poisoned the nef- his nephew and murders uh, uh, murders uh, Tywin, and I love it because they have a, a line from the book that's not in uh, that's not in the show when uh, Tyrion actually did kill Tywin, which is because uh, it, it's almost a thought. Because he says he wondered if um, Tywin Lannister fi- actually shat gold, and yeah. uh, that's you know that they actually put in the uh, put that in the in the play as a soliloquy. And I was like that that's just great. Um, and then uh, 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 Arya sees uh, Lady Crane's performance as Cersei and how she mourns for her uh, son uh, of 
of uh, of uh, Joffrey, and it, it, she orders the death. And but she wants to get closer, and uh, she goes behind the scenes, and the uh, a- actress who plays Lady Crane, I'm sorry, uh, Lady Crane, who is the actress, uh, talks with Arya about how she saw the, the, her, her in. Uh, the uh, galleys uh, for like the past two performances in the crowd, yeah, yeah, and and so Arius says, you know, she was moved by the fact that, you know, uh, that uh, Cersei was just a mother who loved her son, and they they weren't monsters; they were just they were just people who thought they were doing what was right by their family, and she begin. You see this evolution of her character where she starts to develop and says, like, okay, yeah, I I'm not. Th- this whole list thing is kind of ridiculous uh, about like killing particular people just for revenge is ridiculous and frankly it's no better than uh, anyone else who I would kill for my very short sighted revenge so uh, she leaves and uh, the actors go backstage and Lady Crane's about to drink uh, the rum that she spikes until Arya slaps out of her hand and says don't drink that and also, be wary of, of the uh, understudy that she has, because she wants you dead. Even though I don't think we ever we ever see any uh, actual insinuation that she was the one who did order the hit. Right. Or anything, but uh, she's like, oh, I guess she's the scapegoat now. And uh, so we have uh, the, the faceless one. Uh, oh, no, no, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember his name. Is it Jaquin? Um... Yeah, something like that. Jack, Jack in, I don't know how to pronounce it. Hey, yeah, so. he gets he gets uh, he he gets weary of this uh, of this failed contract that Arya was supposed to complete by uh, by the Wolf, mm. and then uh, she pretty much is urging him or urging to get permission to go kill her, and, and that's kind of kind of where it leads to as as he's in the middle of like scalping someone's face off as like <laughs> what they're usually fine with me. What they're usually doing. Um, and, and that sets up the next episode too. Yeah, I was going to set up the next episode. He reluctantly agrees to this, uh, contemplating uh, it's a shame that Arya had, had a lot of gifts, but and then allows to the Wolf to proceed to go uh, kill her since she didn't complete the her final uh, her final uh, option or her last chance that she had. And then I guess Arya decides that fuck this, this is not worth it. And then she goes <laughs> and retrieves Needle. We see Needle. Yay! Yeah. She's a Stark again, and she has forsaken her desire to become the, a faceless man, and once mm-hmm. more is embracing her destiny as Arya Stark. What, yeah. what that means, I don't know. She hides in the catacombs of Bravos and blows her out her candle and, and waits in darkness for the retribution I, she knows is coming. I, I know. Uh, I think we all know what that means uh, to be a Stark, which is to die really, really badly, even though you have the best of intentions. That is. Uh, that is a tradition of being Stark at this point. Tradition. Noble like the people at Toussaint, but end up getting killed in some way, shape, or form. Oh yes. And uh, in the in the Riverlands, we have uh, Walder Frey receiving word that River Run is completely lost and taken over by Brendan Tully, and he chastises his sons for letting Tully get away from the Red Wedding, and the fact that like uh, uh, the Freys and the Walders have. Uh, the superior numbers, House Malister and Blackwood have risen up against the Freys and the Bo- and the Brotherhood without banners, I, are rallying the small folks and are raiding their supply lines and camps. And I think this is going to be the movement to essentially purge all the jackasses out of the beginning movements of purging the jackasses out of uh, Westeros. And uh, Walder says, like, listen, he, he's not a smart man. He's a he's a very egotistical man because he's like you will take back our stronghold for humiliating us. He's basically Skeletor. Yeah, and then and then like he just has no strategy at all. He's just like he's just acts on acts on instinct and not strategy alone. Like uh, I think he was talking to this like his under his underlings and uh, they're like there's only like oh my god I can't wait to talk about the ne- next episode you see how this plays out <laughs> it was like there were like five of them it was like how are we supposed to take back the freaking how are we supposed to take back River Run it was like five of us <laughs> <laughs> they, they they have an awesome scene in the in the next episode that oh that, I can't wait to talk about that one but uh, back yeah. in 
it, it, yeah, I mean, it gets unveiled that they ha- they ha- they have as a prisoner Ed Mertelli, and we'll see how that plays out as well. I didn't think this would play out really well for them either. Like, it, as we know, I think there's some insinuation. I think it was mentioned. I know in the books that that um, Brendan Tully couldn't give a rat's ass about Ed Muir if if there was some kind of negotiation going on. Uh, but and that, Brendan Tully is, is is Catelyn Stark's uncle, which we saw like a couple seasons back. This is where things like these re- recurring characters that are brought up that weren't really hugely important that are suddenly kind of important for you to remember because it's going to build up to something. This is where the stuff yeah. like this gets lost in translation where you forget. There's a delicate compromise between exposition and uh, pace. And this was problematic because we don't have a whole lot of time in the show to say, okay, this, this, and this, here's this, we have these characters, here, this uh, this character relates. And so you're kind of just, you're kind of catching up to say, okay, who is this person? How do I connect this? Like, I can't, I can't quite remember who that character was. And it's a little problematic, even with the flashbacks at the beginning of the episode. Yeah. Of, uh, of what's going on. So, um... Yeah, we get back to wrap up this kind of uh, episode. You know, much like any, much like kind of the last one, I think too. A lot of this, just, we get a lot of snippets of interesting things, but it just feels like. I mean, it's all set up, of course, but it just it, it's just damn, just one of those episodes that go by so quick again. That just even the next one too goes by so quick. So like so much, so much uh, little things, so much little different scenes that that don't a lot. A lot of the scenes don't have too much going on but they are all there for setup but they all leading to something mm-hmm. back to the Dothraki Sea we get Danny and Eric Banna Jr. and talk <laughs> about their acquirements of 100,000 Kal- Kalazars and she yeah, and they, uh, hmm? what was that? Oh, they, they talk specifically about uh, of Eric Banna saying uh, how many ships do we need and she says a thousand which I thought was a little on the nose for the writing. It's like, okay, we get it. You're setting up a maybe possible alliance with uh, Aaron in the future, but yeah. you could have thought of a le- I don't know, just like maybe oh, may- hundreds, maybe thousands. Like that's like you could have said that instead of like a thousand. I don't know. I, I mean was- that. Yeah, we'll see. And and in Game of Thrones time, that'll be in three episodes or two. And like, <laughs> I'm still freaking. I still want to see how they pulled this shit off, man. Making like they made they made it seem like it'd be so easy to make these ships like to make these <laughs> ships in like two episodes. Crazy. He's like, this is gonna take like twenty years to make these ships. What are you talking about? Oh my god! See, uh, do you not know that all of our other uh, strongholds are being raided? Like, shouldn't we f- focus on that instead of building a thousand ships to sail across the sea to find? Uh, people who don't really matter right now yeah so Danny rides Danny tells everybody to wait as she rides off and then in a couple of minutes what go by and uh, Eric Banner Jr. is worried so she, he's gonna go uh, look for her and then all of a sudden you see Drago fly off fly into the above above where everybody is and you see Danny riding on the dragon and um and then ask if the Colossar is willing to cross the narrow sea and defeat their the armies of the seven kingdoms, and then rips down the the keeps of its or of its lords, mm-hmm. as Drago had promised. And then when they shout their affirmation, Daenerys reminds them that every call in history has selected three uh, blood riders to ride at his side at the head of the Kalazar. And then Danny, however, is not a call and does not have the abide by the rules. And therefore, she declares the entire Kalazar her blood riders. Very much a uh, very interesting uh, power hungry scene. She's very power hungry. I I love. She just she doesn't give a damn about anyone else's culture or traditions anymore. No. Where she's <laughs> she's just like I know like this is what tradition demands, but fuck tradition. Listen to me. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah. And- but that was the yeah that was the end of the episode. The highlight kind of the highlight there was uh, I guess her riding on dragon. I don't know where the hell the dragon came from, but. That's cool. They, they, um, they certainly have a very interesting setup for uh, Daenerys, and I hope they use it well. But, but uh, we have 
Are we um, transition. Now we transition yeah. into the, the next, the recent episode of last last Sunday's was the the Broken Man. Yeah, it's and, and we get uh, a scene very early on. I thought this was this, or I, for a second. I thought this was them actually building the the the, great, the great joys, actually building the the ships. But it turns out to be just some other kind of separate side story, and and then we actually get the appearance of Ian McShane, which we heard a while back that he was going to be on the show. We didn't really know how much of an a, a, a of an effect he'll have, like how much of a major character he would be. Mm-hmm. And as we find out later on the show, it it wasn't very for it wasn't very long. But I know I think I've heard that he was a very big fan of the show, so he ended up making just an appearance on this episode, which he had a, such an impact as well because he's such a great actor. Oh yeah. And the weird thing, actually, I don't think he was a very big fan at first. In fact, I think there was a controversy surrounding the fact that he said something to the extent of, oh, Game of Thrones is just dragons and tits. He's not wrong, but, you know, with the, with, the, <laughs> with the tone that he took, he was like, it's not really art. And I think he was still um, a little bit miffed at the fact that uh, Deadwood, which was the big HBO show before Game of Thrones, um, yeah. was canceled, and one of the reasons why was because I think it was cited that it was too expensive, and then here comes Game of Thrones, which is like the most expensive show that they've ever done. Right. And so, it, makes, it was... Uh, I'm sorry, yeah? Makes you yearn for Deadwood to come back. Oh, yeah. Ian McFucking Shane. The only role where he doesn't swear... Yeah, it was, it was freaking awesome. Um, but we get the reveal, as I thought this would happen at some point, because we never, as the we've established from the show rules, that there's no, um, unless we actually see a death happen, it doesn't, it hasn't happened. Like I still don't, I still believe that Stannis is still alive. I still believe yeah. it. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to explain it, but there's. I still don't believe he's dead. And even then, I don't know how much impact he'll have as well, because he was kind of, like, very driven to regain what was rightfully his, and and kind of technically, technically it was, but at the same time, a lot of that, a lot of that inspiration to get power back ended up blinding his logic and not making him the best leader, which we saw as, like, how that old battle between him and the Boltons turned out, it was just, as we saw from, like, above... It was just didn't turn out very well. He was also incredibly stupid. It's like, listen, I understand if your religion dictates you to uh, sacrifice your child, you didn't need to do it in front of your damn army. That's true, yeah. And and traumatize half of them to leave. <laughs> it was so. It was. It was a. It was an interesting degradation of <laughs> him losing his mind. Oh God, yeah, and you know everything was, the Lord of Light did not. Everything that the Lord of Light was was told to be true did not come true. Mm-hmm. Um, Fortunately, we have John, the only good guy left, Snow. Yeah, um, so we we get the surprise. I don't know. It, it was pretty cool. I thought it was a pretty yeah. interesting unveiling. We got we got we find out that the the Hound is alive and is hanging out with these pretty much the hippies of Westeros. Yeah, oh built, my, just yeah. building a house. It, it, and I love the transition where it's like everyone's gathering, uh, uh, building this giant wall. I, for a second, I thought they were going to show the beginnings of how they built the wall in the north, when right. it wasn't you know cold like when it was spring or summer, and then slowly as winter encroaches, they doing it right. But no, it was present day or soon to be present day, and you have like these teams of three guys like carrying these huge logs, and then in the back it just got one guy carrying a huge log. But there's something obviously wrong with his leg, and it's mangled up, so he drops it. And then we see, oh my gosh, it's the Hound. Yeah. And uh, he, <laughs> Ian McShane is, of course, the, the one role we never assumed he would have, the hippie leader. He's like, no, you gotta let believe in love and tranquility. Love, piece of love, man. <laughs> He's Bob Dylan. Oh man, it's gotta go with it. Yeah, and then they they really had some really cool, writ, really well written back and forth on um, on their thoughts on like on justice and also kind of like where his previous actions may or may lead him or how talks about how like uh, if there was justice in the world he you know the things that he's done he'd be uh, dead he'd be dead and then he's and then he responds perhaps there's uh, 
perhaps he has been punished already, or the gods has already punished him already. Mm-hmm. And then we get like a, a group of like people that I didn't necessarily know right away unless I looked it up. Like the some members of the Brotherhood without banners shows up and trying to extort the group for whatever the hell they had. Mm-hmm. I was like, come on, guys. These guys are just freaking building the house. Why do you gotta go kill them? It's because they have food. <laughs> it, it wasn't even... Okay, they weren't uncordial. They were... It was weird. It was like, uh, we don't really have any... Because they started like, okay, what, do you have any gold? No. Do we, like... Do you have any clothes? Just the ones on our back. Um, okay, what about food? Yeah, we got enough food. You want to eat with us? No, you give us all the food. It's like, uh, that escalated pretty quickly. Like, I'm not even sure they have any alcohol, man. I like. I, I think you should just leave them alone. Yeah, it was. It was. It was really weird. I, I, I had, there's, there was a discussion about to, about them too. Like, I know their whole their whole purpose, at least with the. At least what we what we saw from Derek Dondarian, Derek Dondarian was that their whole purpose of the Brotherhood Without Banners was just like to help people out. They were like, they were like kind of the Robin Hood of Westeros a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it also seems like this is a good. This is what George R. R. Martin does so well. Like this is just it goes into like a lot more depth than originally what was kind of like their initial intent. At least with the Beric Dondarian side. I know there's, like, multiple folks a part of the Brother Without Banners, but it kind of gets to the point where, like, it just kind of leads to a, a sense of them contradicting themselves at some point. It seems like they, they want to help out people and also work against, like, the... any kind of downtrodden... any injustice that goes on, but at the same time, like, when they do this, they just, like, there's a couple of more folks they have, but it comes to the point where... They have like decent amount of power, and then they end, ended up turning. They end up turning the same. They, they end up being the same thing that they're going against at the same time. Yeah, being I, corrupted by power over I, time. There was something that caught my uh, attention because they say um, the night is long and full of terrors, as uh, you know, referencing the Lord of Light. And I do wonder if they're actually representing the Brotherhood without banners or if they're religious zealots posing as brotherhood without banners or like I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the transition is because the scene was supposed to come off as a tense stalemate and uh, it ends with a threat that I don't think they really explained kind of what the situation is, was with these guys yeah they may they, or they may just be like uh, on the kind of like uh, not officially part where they're like kind of like the like the bandits who join up and just say oh we're brotherhood without banners I without think so. really understanding I think so I think they're just kind of like on the coattails of them but I know that they're a core of the brotherhood of without banners are, were, were formed from like the force of like a hundred soldiers that, that Ed Stark himself sent out under the command of like Beric Dardarian to bring like uh, Gregor Kulain, Gregor Kulain to justice that was the whole purpose of them. That's how they ended up forming. So they may these make these guys may not be from the original uh, hundred folks to try to take out the mountain um, for raiding the for raiding the villages and the riverlands because you know there was a whole backstory with with them like with uh, Tywin sending them out to go rape and pillage people. Oh yeah. So there is that. So these guys may be just like uh, these like uh, just like the just like the freaking. Um, other guys that you can't really trust as well, even though they're a part of the group, just kind of not, not really out of like. Uh, Once they're out of earshot, they'll do their own thing. Yeah, just like the just like some folks off the wall, you know, they're not necessarily there because they want to be there. They're just kind of forced to be there. Um, and they'll, if any opportunity they can get, they'll just they'll stab you in the back any chance to get or or put a bad word out there for a certain group. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we had that interaction, and we'll just kind of go through there the whole story arc, because I know it kind of goes back and forth, but later in the unveiling, um, the Hound knows that this is some shit's going to go down, and he just, like, tell it goes in the back and forth conversation with Ian McShane and talking about how Ian McShane was like, uh, you don't cure violence by by creating spreading. more violence or spreading it, and, and, he, and he goes back with him saying, like, you don't cure violence either by dying, so it's like, it's a really good 
really good back and forth between them. They're able to get very interesting philosophy in a very simple sentence. Yeah. And it's... Ian McShane was... He he stole the entire uh, episode. Yeah. So it kind of ends later on. We'll just summarize it real quick with that story arc. Uh, He Mm -hmm. goes off to... The hound goes off to chop some wood. And then he returns to find just all the villages murdered. And then um, Ian McShane getting hanged. It was just oh. a, a quick send off with him. It was just like one off right there. How dare you do that to Blackbeard? He's a hound all pissed off. And this may be his redemption. He may go on the path of redemption to maybe being a better person or something. Or, and then he the goes, way he picks and then, up that axe, though. Yeah. I was I, so excited. I was like, damn it, this episode's over. He goes, picks up the axe, and then heads off. He may go after them, or he just may be on his other way to to kind of lay low. Mm-hmm. Because it's all, it's all purposeful it's just to get some get some money for bringing an Arya to the Riverlands. Or not Maybe not the Riverlands, but where where uh, Peter Baelish is right now, over there. Mm-hmm. And leave, leave To get some reward over with his aunt that's no longer there anymore. The, to Tully got pushed off. Mm-hmm. Peter Baelish, but that was his whole intent. And then Brian got involved and that kind of ruined all his plans to go off on and lay low on some with some extra cash. Yeah. So that there was that. Where 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 do we go? We go back oh, to and, and the scene of just like, who took you out? Just like, was it an army? It was one person. Like, uh oh. like how did he? Like how did how well did he fight? Like it was a woman. Ha 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 ha. Women doing things. That was funny. It's like oh 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 old school Ian McShane. Yeah. And then uh, in King's Landing. Uh, we have uh, so rest in peace, Ian McShane. Rest we have peace. Marjorie, yeah, uh, uh, studying uh, the uh, Seven Pointed Star, and uh, when she talks to the High Sparrow about uh, the Mother of Mercy and the High Sparrow, saying that like without reading, uh, the pe- people who read the tomes uh, know so little without actually having the love of their heart, like an actual mother would. And fathers who don't even aren't even able to read know the father's mercy uh, so much better. And it's a very interesting idea of kind of this inherent sense of ethics that's not really learned in study, but rather in actual family. Right. And he gets in, and he also gets in there about uh, uh, Tom High, High Sparrow talking about how her and Tommen should have the. Uh, have an offspring, and then she kind of asks her why they haven't haven't gone full force with that, and then she's kind of like going around the subject about uh, her wanting to be as pure as possible, and then and then just she's not of, driven by desires. Yeah, and the and the sparrow king uh, king sparrow that might be happening. King sparrow, yeah. Uh, High sparrow says like, yeah, it doesn't really matter if you want to do it or not. We. Uh, the king needs an heir, and you just need to be willing to do that. And then we get the scene with uh, Olena trying to talk to Marjorie, and then we finally find out that she's actually that Marjorie's actually uh, playing the sparrow, which I figured because it just seemed like it was so because the acting was so good, but it just seemed like it was so quickly it was so abrupt, quickly abrupt turned already. So I, I I figured that that was the case that she was playing playing uh, playing him. To figure out whatever decide whatever they're gonna decide to plan out, and uh, she gives she slips Elena a piece of paper into her hand. In doing so, she seems to have successfully communicated to her that she doesn't quite mean what she's been saying in front of the, the Septa, Elena, who was just mm-hmm. standing by, creeping. And then uh, oh, I, I hate her. She yeah. just reminds me of the old jerk of a of a nun in the Blues Brothers movie, <laughs> the Penguin. And then, as soon as she gets some privacy, Elena privately unfolds the piece of paper and finds that there's a rose drawn on it. She seems uh, cheered by the silent message, as the use of the Tyrell's sigil indicates that Marjorie is merely tricking the sparrows. That her, her true loyalty is still to House Tyrell. I thought it was pretty pretty cool in a subtle way to kind of give her the message that that she's uh, that she's really all there, and not and also good. It also good as well as a as a contingency as if it ended up getting leaked in any way. Like rather than just blatantly saying, "I'm I'm okay, I'm not turned," I uh, just pretty much give a <laughs> the sigil, kind of giving her the message. I would like somebody to uh, re-edit that scene 
where she uh, she just Elena just opens it up and just says, "Get me the hell out of here." <laughs> And then we get uh, Cersei later confronts Elena in, about her plans to leave, and in, and in telling her to remain for the sake of Marjorie and and Loras, who's who's still in prison. And then Elena retorts that the reason of all this happening is because of Cersei's stupidity, which, in 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 hindsight, it's true. She gave yeah. power to to these guys, and it just ended up buying her in the ass. Uh, as the Republican Party well knows, when you uh, <laughs> cater to extremists, you get run by extremists. There we go. And Cersei, yeah, that, Cersei admits that she's made a mistake with the Sparrows, but insists that an alliance between the Lannisters and Tyrells is more important now than it ever was. And Elena tells Cersei, I wonder if you're the worst person I've ever met. At a certain age, it's hard to recall, but truly, but the truly vile do stand out through the, through, the, through the years. Do you remember the way you smirked at me when my grandson and granddaughter were dragged off to their cells? <laughs> I do. I'll never forget it. Oh, jeez. Ed. Yeah. And then she notes that Cersei has neither influence, has no has no influence nor support anymore and is surrounded by enemies. She tells Cersei that she will be leaving the city as soon as possible and Cersei, uh, and that Cersei's utter defeat is her only consolation. That makes, is the only happy part that she gets out of this, that, that Cersei's miserable and she's been defeated pretty much mm -hmm. by this whole, by this whole turn of events. Oh hell yeah, and it's it's just it's uh, oh it's wonderful. I still feel sad for Tommen just because it's just like oh dude, you have no idea what you're doing. Please just like join the Wildlings and Jon Snow because it's not going to get any better in King's Landing. Yeah, and, and however this ends up working out, it, it can definitely lead to the Tyro's favor if there's some kind of way that Marjorie will manipulate her way into power it certainly can happen through the through the through the works of uh, of an offspring and easily somehow in some indirect way Tommy can get killed and that's that's it mm -hmm. except for Cersei she's at a loss of power at this point she's got the only thing she has left basically is uh, the trial by combat with the mountain yeah and that's it uh, that's gonna be really cool to see too. I wonder how that's gonna pan out. She's gonna and you know, ten bucks says the high sparrow brings out like Robo Oberon <laughs> for a rematch, a rematch against of Franken. all ages, twice in a <laughs> lifetime. It's it, uh, Me Mecha Oberon versus uh, uh, Mountainzilla. Oh my god! Yeah. And uh, in the north, king in the north, uh, John San uh, John Sansa and Davos are. Are finding uh, allies for Winterfell and Ramsay, and the first uh, they try to talk with the wildlings, and you know they say like, "Listen, this isn't our fight. Like, we, you know, we'll help you against the White Walkers, but we're not going to do anything, uh, you know, for the North. And this isn't our fight." And John says, "Yes, yeah, it's it's not your fight. It really isn't. It's I really am sorry that, that I'm asking you to, to do this because this isn't to the terms that we agreed upon. But the fact of the matter is, um, the Boltons." And uh, all their allies are going to, to kill you the second that they can. And that it doesn't matter if they don't, because then if they decide to turn around and then uh, leave, the White Walkers are going to come in to kill you. And the only way we're going to be able to take you know hold the North is if we have all the families together. And uh, you know they, they realize that they have a uh, uh, you know really no choice. And I just love the fact that. John is incredibly honest, and he's not trying to manipulate. He's like, no, no, you need to see this as, as like a future uh, salvation <laughs> yeah. for your people. He's just like, no, that yeah, this sucks. I'm sorry. There's no way that we can really, uh, you know, once again, nice guy, John Snow, who is you know just so honest. He's like, I, I'm, and Tormund's like, listen, the guy died for us. He literally died for us. Maybe we should just return the favor and. Of course, the second they have the giant uh, one one on their side, just like going Jon Snow, and then giving that little nod, and then just like, oh, no, the wildlings are with them now. Yeah, I thought it was a really cool scene, and it it, it certainly it was really well done. So it's like they don't necessarily have to do this, but it's it's more of a it's more of a priority than ever to team up and to take back. Winterfell 
you know, and and also they have to worry about the White Walkers as well. So it's not something that they necessarily have to do, but it's certainly it's something that they need to do. It's not. It's just more. It's more. It's more than just their house at this point. I think. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I love how in Westeros, Jon Snow is the only one who's saying, uh, there are zombies coming for us. Can we please knock off this? Who's the king? Whose houses will rule? Who gets gold? Because we it doesn't matter when the zombies come. It, it seems like it's less and less a little bit about that. Uh, well, at this point, I think the only ones that are kind of biding for power at this point now is with Cersei trying to get power back and also uh, uh, Danny as well, but she has like little to no idea of this, this even going on with the White Walkers at this point. Yeah, it, I have a feeling that uh, speaking of Danny, I think there is going to be a power struggle when she comes back, and and Tyrion, and uh, uh, Tyrion, you know, because he's he's wheeling dealing in uh, uh, back in Marine, and it's actually working. And it's like, okay, it's not immediate as everyone would want to, but it's actually working to everyone's benefit. The harpies have died down, and it's just like, oh, okay, well, I guess this is peaceful. And Daenerys is just going to come back and be like, no, I want this done now! Destroy the slaveholders! The masters must die! And then Tyrion's just like, calm down, Queen, please. We have, <laughs> we have, we have, we have to work very carefully here. Yeah, all the work I put into you, not going to ruin it. I, yeah, it's... I mean, just Tyrion finally gets his opportunity to rule correctly, and it's taken away. Yeah, and uh, we get a pretty cool scene, too, where they try to recruit uh, soldiers for their uh, their, uh, their rally House against... Uh, yeah, their rally against uh, the Boltons, so they go to the House of Mormons, which, as we know, is part of the family lineage of the, the previous commander, or Commander Mormon, that was he got in the previous season that was... Uh, it's pretty much the mentor for Jon Snow, and we get like uh, Lyanna Mormont is kind of like the the head of the the House of Mormont, and she's like what like ten, twelve years old. So it's like she'll occasionally, as we get in the scene, occasionally get like whispers of like all like information and, and just kind of things to do or say, I guess, from the like, from the maester, maester, from yeah. maester, yeah. And then uh, Davos comes in there when everything's not really working. John Sansa saying like she is like no, she has like wants no part of it, wants to contribute like no troops, and then Davos like sways her a little bit and they end up getting 62 soldiers out of it. (laughs) I gotta say, uh, this young actress, she knocked it out of the park. She was able to, because it's it's authoritative in a way that that a veteran actor would do it, not as a child would do it. There's still that air of like, not of a child not having enough experience to really uh, uh, know what she's doing, which is whenever she goes to the maesters. I just love the little smile Davos has when she says, uh, "We'll give you sixty-two men," and then this, and everyone, this, this, this dead sounds like, uh, "I'm sixty-two hundred." It's like, no, <laughs> sixty-two. But they fight like ten men, and uh, you know Davos says, "Like, oh, if they if they fight as well as you, ma'am, then well, I'm I know they'll do fine." Well. If we can only get, we're, we're better than nothing. I yeah, hope these soldiers is. live up to some uh, some expectation. I hope they're like sixty two mountains at least. Yeah, that would be great. If just like sixty two half dragon breeds. Like uh, you didn't tell us this. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that, was a, this. that was a great scene. Um, yeah, and they, they, House Glover. They go to House Glover. See, see how that panned out. Find the, the leader, Donald. Donald Glover. <laughs> Danny Glover. Get the shit. <laughs> yeah. Danny Glover. Sorry, you got the got my Glovers mixed up. That's right. Mm-hmm. So what ended up happening here, CH? The House Glover. Uh, they get a reception from Robert, who says, "Yeah, the you know your uh, you know your brother Rob, uh, John Snow. Well, he def- uh, failed to protect me from the Ironborn, and so we really didn't have much uh, choice when they invaded the Deepwood Moat." Uh, and pris- imprisoned my family and brutalized all my subjects. So, really, that's your fault, and screw you guys. I'm not wasting any more time on you. Sansa tries to get come back and say, like, oh, trust me, it's like you pledged uh, fealty to House Stark. And he's like, I don't give a damn. It's like, you guys have outstayed your welcome. Like, the only reason that I even gave you this uh, hearing is because of my respect for your father. He's dead. 
And frankly, you're not doing anything for me. Get out. That was such a... F I'm messed up. Oh, God, so yeah, cold-blooded. I mean, that's uh, Game of Thrones. One second you're up, the next second you're down. And, uh, yeah, there's not so many... Uh, so There's not only, so many that they've recruited. No, nah, not a whole lot. They only managed to scrape up at least like a, a few hundred extra soldiers. Um, and, Dav and Davos it, and Davos goes off to deal with like this brawl that goes on amongst the wildlings. It's just now doesn't seem like it's very organized right now at this point. It's just a lot of uh, a lot of high tensions going on and, and a lot of pressure to gather as much truth as possible. And, and Sansa wants to gather as much truth as possible. John is like, it's very adamant that they have to attack Winterfell as soon as possible before Ramsay rallies more forces together before the, the, the weather turns on them. Mm -hmm. Sansa disagrees with this and they try to opt for more for more uh, recruitments from other houses, but John refuses and to change his mind on this subject and uh, Sansa begins writing a letter to be sent by a raven to an unknown party which will I think people dis uh, deciphered. They're, they're so into this that they read what the letter said. I don't remember. I didn't read the article. What was actually written on that letter? Uh, yes, people were doing detective work. I'm not sure who it is, but it's probably Peter Peter Baelish and the and the Bail. Peter Baelish and the Bail, uh, and or maybe it's the Tyrells. Who know? But, um, I'm actually uh, yeah looking through this because she was writing something and put it on the sigil. Photo savvy fan has figured out what Sansa was writing in the uh, this week's episode. Uh, let's see. Enhance. Was, mm -hmm. Enhance. Spoiler free thumbnail. <laughs> Rotate. So apparently Sansa's time with Bailey rubbed off on her at least a little. She's writing letters to friends or foes unknown behind her brother's back. And then. Uh, can't make up. Uh, Let's see. I'm just trying to read through this. You gotta get to enhance. I'm like, this is like freaking Blade Runner types of like work they did to enhance this. Thirty-five fifty-nine enhance. <laughs> uh, some stuff in here. You promised to protect me. Now you have a chance to fulfill your promise. Knights of the Vale are under your command. Ride north for Winterfell. Lend us your aid, and I shall see that you are rewarded. Mm. It seems more like it's uh, it may it may be uh, yeah related to to the Peter Baelish there. I mean, he mentioned that he was gonna go to take back Winterfell too, and like indirectly as well, like without even consulting like this stuff that they were even discussing about taking back. It seemed like he was gonna head out there anyways in the, like the last episode or two. Mm -hmm. Is that what he remember what he said? I'm gonna meet up, uh, and I assume probably take uh. Probably they're probably going to meet up at some point, and there's going to be some tension between John and Sansa when uh, he discovers that she called all the other houses to aid, and Sansa's probably promising more than she can deliver. Where, it's Ryan you know, with Screen Rants Future News of the Day. Reward them with what? Because they don't have Winterfell yet, and they will like good land. Is you know, with John, he's appealing to people's sense of morality and like practicality. With Sansa, she's trying to appeal to. to abstract rewards for the future that they don't have and that they have no claim to yet so that's going to be a problem I feel yeah it's, it's going to be interesting well it basically means that Littlefinger owes Sansa in some way and it's going to be a big moment for her that it's going to be the first time that she's really stood up to Peter Baelish and it's kind of her showing him that she's smarter and stronger and that not one to be manipulated anymore which mm -hmm. is kind of like eh 50-50 with her yeah, <laughs> but it's gonna. It's it seems like the more uh, logical reason at this point. I mean, they, certainly the Vale has a lot more, uh, not more soldiers, but you gotta also take it to the fact that they, I know they mentioned this that they haven't really had much combat for combat for a lot long time. So who knows how good they will be in this? But it's better than nothing. Better than sixty two, mm -hmm. sixty two soldiers. Uh, six hundred and ten. I'm sorry, six hundred and twenty because uh, they fight with the strength of ten men. Uh, apparently so uh, yeah we get that um, nice build up and set up for the next episode very very much and uh, we go back to the river run real quick and then we get uh, Jamie and Braun. cool to see Braun back again 
mm-hmm. heading to the gates of River Run, and then the fra- some members <laughs> of the phrase is like five of them. Uh, I love how I'm sorry to interrupt, but I love how Bron just says like, uh, uh, you know, Jamie's like, oh, don't worry, I'll pay you and all the things that you promised and more. A Lannister always pays. Don't say it. Don't just fucking say it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Jamie uh, then see that these uh, people. People, the, some of the members of the phrase uh, threatening to execute uh, Edmund Tully and the Blackfish calls their bluff and refuses to surrender the, the river run. <laughs> Disgusted with the phrase's competence, Jamie takes charge of the siege and attempts to parlay with the Blackfish, warning him that the Lannisters will show no mercy to the Tullys, but if he surrenders, the, the lives of his men will be spared. Blackfish uh, rejects an offer, the offer to Jamie and warns that he has two years' worth of food in his stronghold and that the while hundreds of his own men may die defending thousands of Lannister troops will perish as well mm-hmm. so there goes that scene there I love just the ending of it it's like I came out to see if you were a disappointment you are a huge disappointment goodbye <laughs> <laughs> he just wastes time just to, just to say F you and yeah. I love how just uh, the incompetence of the Tully's like we'll kill him we'll do it it's like then do it <laughs> damn it <laughs> what do we do now our only bargaining chip has not worked. I, and, oh, and not to mention the incredible gold-handed pimp slap that yes. they have. It's like, if you're going to do, if you're going to have a threat, follow it out. For instance, if I were to threaten you with violence if you kept talking, would you believe me? What do you talk slap? <laughs> it's like, oh, that was that was good. So we uh, we get that scene, which is pretty cool. We go back to Volantis with. Uh, yeah, Theon and, and Yara taking part of some festivities in this brothel, and Theon just sits there uh, as, Yara's, no pintel. as Yara's making out with a bunch of chicks. And then and Yara repeatedly tells Theon to drink some ale, and then he refuses, and Yara persuades him to regain his f- former identity and self-confidence. And she was needed as assistance in the retaking of the Iron Islands from their uncle Euron. Mm-hmm. When pressed, he says that if justice were served, he would be burned for his crimes, so she responds, fuck justice then, do it for revenge, and then eventually convinces him to put his guilt aside and help her because she needs him. He drinks some more ale and begins to gain some composure, then reveals to Theon that she plans to take the Iron Islands to flee to Marine and forge an alliance with Daenerys, just like Euron intended to, which mm-hmm. still probably have more chance than him, unless Game of Thrones time logic will dictate that or not. <laughs> And then she goes to have sex with a female prostitute. Mm-hmm. I, I really enjoyed the scene because I was really confused by it. Uh, it was, it's like okay, so they stop at Volantis. Why? It's like you're you're in hot like the your your uncle's in hot pursuit. You don't have time for uh, shore leave. Like, what are you doing here? Like, they don't they didn't really explain it that well. No, not and, necessarily. No. And I also enjoy, really enjoyed the argument, like, Theon, keep drinking. Trust me, you'll you'll have your wits about you if you drink more alcohol. Which you'll, is contradictory. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, list like, well, I'll, I'll buy you ten penises if you if you if you join with me. Uh, and it just, it, um, I just really did not. Uh, I didn't get like the, the the composure of the scene. There was like maybe a little bit of a transition, just like, oh, okay, we need to stop here for supplies. Hey, the guys are in bad morale. Let's let, give them one good night of shore leave, and then we'll head on out. It's just like, oh, we're celebrating and having a fun time. It's like, did you not see the last episode where you guys were running for your lives from the murderous wrath of your uncle? Yeah. So there's that. Uh, a lot of a lot of quick things going on here in this episode. Um, we go back to uh, Bravos, and Arya tries to secure passage to back to Westeros by bribing, by bribing, oh, I can't even speak, bribing mm. a Westerosi elite uh, trader. However, she, uh, uh, it happened real quickly. I thought like, oh shit, she gets she gets stabbed by the wolf, and I was like, oh my god, is this it for Arya? And then she gets she ends up getting uh, escaping by jumping into the river. But like, she's got that like Lara Croft syndrome right there. She gets like. <laughs> stabbed her and impaled and she's still kicking uh, no it's not Laura Croft syndrome because it doesn't happen uh, 26 times in a single minute I mean Where... that's going to be something for the next episode CH we need to see Arya get stabbed pushed into the river uh, she gets smacked against a, a log like her arm gets trapped underneath a boulder and then a giant 
Ty comes out and scratches her face. And then this, that, this, that, this, that, and then just and it, it like it that'd be great if it like ended with her still being assaulted and hurt, and then the next episode opens up with her like continuing being Laura Crofted for like an hour after after the episode ends, like oh my god, make it stop. Yeah, I thought it was a really cool, really cool scene. I didn't I didn't really see it coming, but also I sh- I should have thought that as well. But it seemed I it, it happened so quick that I thought that she was going to be like character got killed off or something. Mm-hmm. And then it's it's crazy. I like how they at least incorporated it more that she's kind of like uh, yeah. I mean she's on the run, but like she's critically wounded and extremely paranoid because like, anybody could be any one of these faceless men. We saw what they can do, and then they can easily stand out in between crowds and like not even couldn't even wink an eye and think that it's them. And it was yeah. just so subtle that they did it. They see like, oh shit, something's gonna happen. And then it's like this older lady just comes up to her, and then all of a sudden she starts stabbing her. Yeah. And she takes off her her face, face off, face off. That was a oh. crazy scene. What, how awesome would it be if that was Nicolas Cage just walking by? He's like, oh, excuse me, lady, do you have the time? Time for you to die. Stab, stab, stab. <laughs> so that's where the, uh, I think the episode concludes right there. It may have been out of order, out of sync, but that's kind of the story arcs we kind of gathered there. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a bit odd. I mean, I I, I kind of feel the same way about uh, the game, uh, I'm sorry, Lord of the Rings movie adaptations where they don't really acknowledge the passage of time as it was in the book because it would just be a bit more confusing and you'd need a little bit more exposition to cover it all, so they just do like, okay, we'll just, we're just going to visually show you the different storylines and how they're all going to meet up later. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty interesting. I mean, there are some certain, certainly some really cool highlights throughout this episode. I mean, Ian, as we talked about, Ian Machine certainly stole this whole episode and I, it was pretty pretty decent episode for some of these cool scenes it's just, it's just what again it just goes by so freaking fast like just a lot of stuff happens and just you know, already the episode's over it's like damn I want to watch yeah. more I don't and, know where this leads to in terms of like uh, why they needed to harken back on the hound I know it, it's cool to see him but I just don't know how much of an effect he's going to have and why it was important to spend a good amount of time with him that is interesting where they haven't brought up um the uh, uh, the return of uh, Catelyn, or you know, the, a lot of the other smaller stuff like Jamie's association with uh, I can't remember his name, but it's uh, his brothers, right? Uh, in the books, I don't remember offhand. Yeah, but to like uh, these other characters who are kind of big. And they're not doing that, so I assume they have to have a good reason because they don't have a lot of screen time for characters who aren't immediately adding something to the whole entirety of the plot. Yeah, that's going to be something we'll have to kind of wait and see. I'm really hoping that they go through that. Uh, really freaking cool to see mm-hmm. uh, Catelyn Stark return as the as the, the zombified self. That'd be really cool to see. Yeah, another talk, I know they talked about it saying that they may not do it, but they, we have been kind of led to believe a certain route, and then haven't come back to go back to where it was. Obviously, it was obvious that it was obvious that uh, John Snow would come back to life, but this it was more it was more predicted and more uh, aligned for that to happen. But we may get a turn in this season. They may be uh, lying. They may be, they may be lying to us that this may happen. It may not happen. That yeah. Lady Stoneheart may hap- may happen. I wish. I hope it does. It, It'd be cool. That would be very very cool, and uh, it'll be interesting to see when all is said and done, uh, as well as with the books. Just seeing what remains uh, there till the end, and what has changed, and what is streamlined, and everything right after it's all done. Same with kind of the Harry Potter movies, where it was like, oh, okay, this is not. This has changed. This is for better. This is for worse. We'll see. Yeah. But uh, all in all, these last two episodes were pretty, uh, pretty good. I had, they had some really, pretty good, good moments and some interesting, really good scenes. And um, yeah, all all very sent, well done. I, I cannot wait for the next ones, man. I'm so excited. Me too. Yeah, that's too. that's been our discussion over the last two episodes of uh, Game of Thrones. 
ladies mm-hmm. and gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And uh, yeah. we'll see what happens on uh, the next one. Let us know what you thought of the, this episode on the previous ones. And uh, we'll be more than glad to keep on talking about the next ones to come and uh, set up a review and discussion for the next one. Yes, I'm looking forward to the seeing the next one and uh, what road the hound takes. Exactly. So I am Splinter for 7, folks, signing off here, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. I am CH Grog. Have yourself a wonderful